with mm -hmm. definitions. Think about what de leadership is, and I want you to throw <coughs> some ideas at me. What is leadership, or what have you heard, or what's your perspective on leadership? Any ideas? What is leadership? Give me an idea. Any thoughts? Influence. Influence? Influence. Influence. Yes, Maxwell says that, and we're going to look into that. Yes, influence. Yes, what else? Any other thoughts on leadership? Servant. Servant? What else? As an example, any other thoughts on leadership? Reliability. I'm sorry? Reliability. Re explain that word. Reliable. Okay, reliable. Reliable. Responsible. Responsible. <laughs> any other words? Any other words on leadership? <laughs> any other words that come to mind? Courage. Huh? Courage. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Yes. Trustworthy. You understand why I write like this, right? So you can't tell my mistakes. Courage. <laughs> any other thoughts? Consistent. Courage. Consistent. He doesn't want to hear that. Current? Correct. Courage. Yeah. Oh, courage. How about current? What's another one? Uh -huh. Stubbornness. <laughs> Stubbornness. <laughs> why? Why? Why, Jenna? You have to be stubborn and not give up when it gets hard. Okay. Tenacity. Huh? A corrector. Director. Or director. <laughs> How about a corrector? Teacher. Yeah. Teacher. Example. Example. Love it. Love it. What's another one? Mentor. It's a mentor. Enthusiastic. <coughs> Enthusiastic. I just want to say to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even do it in Spanish. <laughs> Capable. Huh? Capable. Capable. Okay, what else? Communicator. Communicator, yes. Humble. Yeah. Humble, yes. What else? Focus. Focus. Intentional? Oh my goodness, yes. I don't think you can read any of those sentences. <laughs> I can't. Do you not try me? No. <laughs> so, Sydney University has a, a program on leadership, and they went out on the streets and they asked people about what leadership is and see if we can match any of those people that they match with these. Here's uh, their video. Oh, we don't have the sound. What about that? Let's try that again. I think uh, Ross is going to help us. So from all of these, if you have to choose one, we will look at that a little bit later. John Maxwell, how many of you know who John Maxwell is? If John Maxwell, who has been in leadership for many years, was to choose, you know that he defines leadership as influence. So from the top, which is the one Jerry mentioned, influence will probably be the number one way to explain or simplify what leadership is. And the crazy thing is that we're influencing by many different ways. And so here's the, the, the video, see if we can get, uh, sounds like a little buzz there, but let's see if we can actually get the video. So come up to the that marker. So uh, I look straight down the barrel. You ready to go? All right. Well, let's start. When you think about leadership, what comes to your mind? It's a good question. <laughs> um, leading. A few different words, actually. Uh, probably responsibility, integrity, vision. Someone that you aspire to to want to be like. We often have this idea that leaders are the people who are just like. 
are dictators and they want to want to stop us from doing things and make us forces, put us into place and um, make us be robots. Well, for me, leadership doesn't come from above. It comes from energies that are pushing you up. Inspire confidence in someone to, to get something done. You know, it's not just about you. It's about them, the, the team. Bottom line is that the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts. It's important for generations coming through to have people ahead of them that aren't saying, ah, ah, ah. It's someone who's willing to fight. I think walking the talk rather than just saying things that you don't actually do. I don't know what proportion of the population have cut out to be leaders, but it's probably not that, not that many. You see, I, I'm, I, I believe everyone can. Um, I believe everyone can. <coughs> I think that someone with an eye to humanity's problems um, is really admirable. Be part of the motion of humanity. Standing up, being counted, you need brave people. And also it's exciting to be someone who tries to make a difference. Watching people doing great things and you just feel inspired and want to talk to them and learn from them and do the same or even better things. I think real leadership is about changing people's lives for the better. So let me ask you this, this is a hunting uh, thought. If we are the church, we're leaders in the church, aren't we, bless you, aren't we supposed to be influencing the world around us? Yes. If we are leaders that are doing this, aren't we supposed to be known by this from the world around us? Imagine that the responsibility that we carry then as a church, because if we're all leaders in one community, and look at look at the room around us, this is an incredible group of leaders. Amen. I mean, we shouldn't be stopped to conquer the world for Christ with this number of leaders. If 12 changed the world, imagine what we can all do together. Yes. So the, the, the concept and the idea is something to think that the world is looking at us, the church. It should be, and we should lead in all these different areas. So we're going to, uh, by definition, we're going to stick to influence. So we are influencers. One way or another, we're influencing our kids or we're influencing the people around us here in the community. And so we're going to stick to that. And based on the note that you have a good leader, first, we have to be teachable and we are encouragers for other people in growing in their spiritual life. So now I'm gonna give you numbers and we're gonna break up into small groups. And we're gonna do four groups, see if we have uh, enough space on these tables. And each group is gonna take one of these passages and we're gonna look at this passage together as a group. And I'm gonna be, give you big sticky notes. You're gonna write some of your comments in big words because each group is gonna come up here and you're gonna share your thoughts on what you found. Is leadership or how is that passage related to leadership? Are you ready? I'm going to count. Read us the passage. Okay. My Bible says, It is not that I have already obtained it or already reached the goal. No. I keep pursuing it in the hope of taking hold of that for which the Messiah, Yeshua, took hold of me. Brothers, I, for my part, do not think of myself as having yet gotten hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining forward toward what lies ahead, I keep pursuing the goal in order to win the prize offered by God's upward calling in the Messiah, Yeshua. Therefore, as many of us as are mature, let us keep paying attention to this. And if you are differently minded about anything, God will also reveal this to you. Only let our conduct fit the level we have already achieved. Brothers, join in imitating me and pay attention to those who live according to the pattern we have set for you. Joe, what verse is that? Philippians 3, 12 through 17. Oh, CJB. The CJB. It's the CJB version. Wow. 
It okay. makes sense to me. And so. <laughs> <laughs> I read it in the King James, and then I find a version, and I'm like, oh, yeah. That's it. Okay. All right. So <laughs> Phil read it, and I was like, ugh. <laughs> And I uh, couldn't follow any of it. Uh, so this one uh, okay. comes across. Okay. Kind of so, in the fourth grade level. I'll take it. So, <laughs> be an example. Pudding of encumbrances. Oh, that's all. Oh, you tripped. Yeah, why did you, why did you guys discuss about that? What does that mean? What, what does that mean? A leader putting off encumbrances. Well, a leader can get stuck on himself. Okay, how? How can a leader get stuck? They can be arrogant, prideful, uh, closed minded, um, pessimistic. Did you, did you guys talk about how to maybe prevent, maybe you guys, group number one, how could you prevent yourself from getting to that point? Because leadership, even if you don't want to, people can get you there. People can put you there. If you're a leader by default, People can little by little start putting you in a pedestal mm -hmm. unless you're conscious about it. So, any thoughts on how to prevent that? Yes, we talked about that. Yeah. And it was the next one. Okay. Leave the past in leave the past in the past. What does that mean? Like, what's what good at ST? What can I copy? We got an ED up there. There's no ED though. What can I Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay, what's the next one there? 
jump. Two, can we just two more? Maturity. Uh, how about uh, the attitude one? What did you guys talk about that attitude one? What is that? What does that mean? What should be the attitude that the leader should keep? A good one. <laughs> Who have leadership potential 
who we should not look down upon. Amen. Amen. But we should be a congregation that celebrates young people and that identifies young people's leadership and gives them the platform to do it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because it's not just Timothy, right? It's us meditating and thinking as Paul. Oh my goodness, don't let anyone look down on you. But we need to be conscious about not doing that for the new generation. Because before we know it, we do it. And we start looking down on young people just because they're young, which, you know, they shouldn't do. No, because they're young, they should. Because all revolutions on, in history were led by young people, right? So we need to keep our conscience about that. Great. Two more. Choose two more from the list. Oh, well, I think one of the key ones is this next one, the whole idea of being an example. And it actually, you know, gives certain specifications like what you say, the way that you act, in your love, in your purity, in your faith, you know, among all these different areas to be an example. And um, and then probably just the next one, I'll just go to the, uh, this one sort of stuck out to me because Cynthia and I were part of a leadership organization one time and they constantly were talking about the importance of leaders being readers and always reading and studying and, and, and learning and growing yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, and then being a good listener and being willing to be teachable and hearing from other people. And, <laughs> and then also, um, how do they do that now, Jerry? Help me understand that organization, how do they do that? Because here, it's, it's scripture, it's very clear, it says, attention to the public reading of scripture. Yeah. You can't go to any mall here and do this. You know, they'll kick you out. So how does that look today? I'm not sure if I understand. Are you talking about personally? Okay. You know, I know that you're publicly. Yeah, you're saying, you're saying the devotion of public reading of scripture, preaching and teaching. Well, 6.30 Chick-fil-A on Tuesday morning. <laughs> <laughs> something for heartily and doing it by style that people you see the difference between doing it wholeheartedly and people confusing that with style I just learned today that somebody left relevance because they didn't like my style of teaching <laughs> but you would probably agree that when I teach I'm passionate about it oh, yeah. so how do we distinguish between wholeheartedly and style well you know let me just make a comment about that because all right one of when I first started teaching, yeah. I had an opportunity to, to hear a, a very popular um, educator, and his name was Wong. Okay. And he always said, don't forget, the Wong way is the white way. And you kept on listening to him? But the thing about Mr. Wong, he made, he, made a, he made a comment that I still remember he said, you know, in any school, he said, there's going to be a ton of different styles. You're going to have teachers that are really free flowing and they're, you know, kids are going to be up and moving around and doing stuff. And you're going to, and you're going to have the opposite side of the spectrum. Somebody that's very disciplinarian and very hard and they seem sort of harsh with the students. And everywhere in between, he said, there's a lot of different styles. He said, there's not a best style. He said, the key is, do you love kids? Mm -hmm. Right. right. That's right. And that should be the biggest determining factor is the love that you have for others. In, yeah. in spite of the style, right? Because we're not trying to imitate style. Because yeah. everybody has different style. Okay. And yeah. 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 All right. Number three. Woo! Number three. Number three. A representative for number three. I vote a young person. Uh, a young person. Young person. Yeah, two young person. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> 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 Here, the button's right there. 
right there. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 14, so. Yeah, we read it in two different versions. We read it in the New King James or King James there, uh, the message, but I'm going to read the message. Uh, repeat these basic essentials over and over to God's people. Warn them before God against pious nitpicking, which chips away at the faith. It just wears everyone out. Concentrate on doing your best for God. Work you won't be ashamed of, laying out the truth, plain and simple. Stay clear of pious talk that is only talk. Words are not mere words, you know. If they're not backed by a godly life, they accumulate as poison in the soul. Wow. That's a very interesting version right there. <laughs> So we had so take three of those. Three of those. Um, these are what not. Uh, so as far as good ones, um, unashamed of the gospel, no matter what, don't be ashamed to spread it to whoever, wherever you're at. Um, I can <coughs> specifically say that one where I was. <laughs> um, well, what was the hardest thing? Being in jail and not being ashamed. What was the hardest thing? Nobody's receptive. Nobody is. No. You would think that in jail people would be. One would think. But um, of all the guys, there were 64 guys in the dorm that I was in. Of all the guys that were there, you know, there was a bunch of them who had seen me reading the Bible because that's all I did. Um, I, I tried to stay separated from the group. So it was a big room where the tables were at. So when nobody was out there, that's where I was at. But when everybody was out there, I stayed with them. Um, because they all get noisy and you don't want to I didn't want to be part of what they were doing out there. I didn't want to be included in that group because of what went on in that group. I definitely didn't want to be associated with. Um, but people would see me reading and then come up, oh yeah, I know Ephesians, and rattle the verse off. And 30 seconds later, they're over with a group of guys playing cards. And the biggest, longest string of profanity that you can ever imagine just rolled out of their mouth. Uh, can you just tell me what go you love this verse? So. So they knew the word, but they knew the word, the but it, isn't, it wasn't in their life. Okay, so be, with going with not being ashamed, in that context, you said not very people, not very many were receptive. No. Somewhere. So one was, um, you know, one one person, well, maybe three, but one. The one was gave his life to Christ. Yes. Of the 60-something guys in there. Uh, He's the one that was receptive. The most receptive. So what made you not be ashamed in that context? Boldness, I guess. Um, Were you the only one reading? Yes. Uh, the only one that read it, you know, uh, out where everybody could see it. Everybody and, might go to the book and read it a little bit for five minutes or something. And the Bibles we brought for you, you were able to give at least one of them? One of them, away, yes. Um, and the other one were donated for it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they never got to it. Okay, two more. Take two more. Uh, I'm ashamed of what's another one. Two more. Uh, diligent. Uh, you know, when I was in there, I was diligent at reading every single day, praying when I first got up. And I, I read almost the whole album in 30 days. And so now you're out. Is it, still, it is much harder. It's much harder to stay focused and read at home when you've got three kids and everything going on at home, trying to do stuff to get things straightened back out. Well, you don't recommend any of us going to jail. What else? Um, don't be a nitpicker. Um, oh. I have, I have a problem with that. Give me an example. Nitpicker for me in English. Nitpicker means what? Titus can tell you exactly. <laughs> In Spanish, <laughs> what is nitpicking? It's particular about everything? Critico. Oh, un critico. Oh, yeah. 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 Somebody that is criticizing everything. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's the reason I said that, just because that's the one that I have a problem with. Um, criticizing everything. Not necessarily criticizing everything, but if he doesn't do something all the way or doesn't finish it or doesn't. Do it the right way. Well, the way you like it. The way you like it. Right. 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 The, right. okay. the, the, right. the, the long way. The long way. The long way. Not necessarily. But not necessarily the opposite of an encourager, but 
you know, maybe you can take it too far. Because there's there's a point where they're nitpicking where you're pointing out doing something wrong with right. But nitpicking every little thing, and I know I have a problem with it. Uh, can somebody give me an example of where nitpicking is okay? Where it's okay? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's sort of, okay, I remember Pat Schumar doing a piece yes. one time, and we were really talking about character, but if you're a nitpicker, that's an indication that you're probably a very little person. And so what you've done is you've taken something positive, thoroughness, and turned it into a negative by it being out of balance. So we have basically a nitpicker, something that's not balanced, because he's got some good quality thoroughness, but if it's out of balance, now it turns into a negative. So somebody said sometimes you can tell somebody good character while you are seeing the way they have used them. Okay, so then <laughs> is, there, is there a point where you can be and be positive? Okay, well I think about Casey Carter. Casey Carter. Oh, Casey. <laughs>
Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good in your teaching. Sorry, to make sure I'm right. And, uh, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed uh, because they have nothing bad to say about us. All right, so uh, we focus on basically what's happening in our walk with the Lord as leaders because there's a very much a private life to a leader that has to be um, authentic um, and full of integrity or all of our work is in vain and, and temporary because we'll eventually be discovered as false. Um, okay, how that, because you're talking about a private life that leaders have, how is that authenticity uh, shown to others? If, if we live a private life as leaders, I doubt that we have private lives. Uh, so, because we're all public figures in one sense. So. Well, I think there's always a privacy between us and the Lord that nobody else sees. Okay. And, and is that developing, is that authentic, is that really growing? Uh, and I think time will sh reveal that. I think that you walk okay. enough, you walk long enough with someone, and you see the reality of what's going on in their mind. Um, when we get squeezed, when we get pinched, when we get in a bind. So if the, we'll walk, if the walking with that person okay. at the time, that will help us identify. Okay, and great. The, the integrity of our of our actions will unravel if the integrity of our authentic, <clears throat> authentic private lives is in Okay, two more. Um, Before we take our uh, We must study scripture and then apply it. Um, we uh, must be self-controlled, be clear and honest communicators that we, we follow through with the things that we say. We say <coughs> to another, we have um, unraveled our leadership potential. Um, that was going to follow us if we are unstable in the, the consistency of what we say and what we do. Um, we can encourage her through our example and reflect Christ in all that we do. All right, well. Wow. <laughs> Guys, when we come back, we're going to take a 10 minute break, and when we come back, we're going to break it up one more time, and we're going to look at one more passage, and then we'll be done for tonight. So, thank you so much for being here. Let's take a break. Thank you, Amy, for helping us with some of the refreshments. Here are for Amy. <laughs>
that one. <laughs> we lost it. Always. And so um, even if it's just reverse, you know, hey, click to this this week. And, you know, we'll text back and forth, you know, how are you doing your Bible reading? Um, you know, how can I pray for you? Just connecting with them and being, we're friends. Not, you know, it's not student teachers. We're friends. And I, I'm here to help her in her relationship with, with Christ. So, yeah. You've seen the impact in your life. You've seen the impact of many girls that you disciple through the years. Now we have this great opportunity for the first time as relevance community come together as leaders and consider the seriousness of discipleship and the focus, the laser focus of discipleship. What would you tell all of, all of us, since you've been disciple, you've been disciple and you have been discipling others, are some of the biggest challenges that you face and the biggest uh, joys that you face with discipleship? Someday the world will have opportunity to hear the gospel. That's the plan to reach the world, but also his plan to encourage the sanctification of his church. Yeah, can you, can you sense the passion that this guy has about this fellowship? But let me tell you how I learned about this guy. When I was doing my master's degree at Columbia International University, I heard about this guy at Trinity International University doing groups of discipleship. Unfortunately, 
I got there the year he retired. <laughs> but you go almost everywhere in the world, and if you identify someone that is doing an amazing job discipling others, they're connected to this guy somehow. Because he just gave his life to small groups of men, and he poured his life in sharing the gospel with them and walk with them. And so briefly, Mark 1, 18, um, <laughs> should be 16 to 20. I don't know the, the 16 he said. <laughs> 16 to 20. But um, the idea here is Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee and choosing his disciples. The passage, we can read in many different versions, but I found a really nice video <coughs> that basically shares this passage. So here's the video to illustrate what that might have looked like. Putting aside that Jesus didn't really look like him, but here it is. <laughs> part of uh, who do we disciple, it's challenging because there are so many people in a community of people, how do we choose who are we going to disciple? And the other concept in this passage that's very interesting is that I, I always read the passage, maybe you've heard me say this before, I always thought that the call was to become fishers of men, but that's not the call, the call is to follow Christ. And they laughed their nets, but the call is to follow Christ, not to do stuff for Christ but to be for Christ big difference in being a follower than doing something for him Amen. he doesn't need us That's right. if we don't make disciples somebody else will if we don't take the challenge of taking one other person and mentor that person until they're ready to mentor somebody else somebody else will actually the Bible says that if we don't do it their rocks will do it and people ask me how oh, have you been traveling for so many years 30 years and you're not burning out let me tell you why, because I refuse to see any rocks getting on an airplane and going to Russia. <laughs> that would be such an embarrassing thing, because uh, if that little rock getting on a plane, that should be me. <laughs> so I refuse to let any other person do what God has called me to do. And we, here at Relevance, have an incredible opportunity to be surrounded by leaders that get it, that God wants us to disciple other people. And so here's just basic characteristics of those that we're going to be discipling. One, they must be willing. But not only willing, they have to be available and teachable. Because they can say, yes, I'm willing. But when you say, okay, let's meet Wednesday at 5, they will show up. They were willing, but they were not available. Because well, they're so always busy. Say, how, many, how many people do you know that you could just walk past and say, don't follow me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who are you? Yeah, exactly. Well, there's there's a lot to that passage, too, that we don't know. But the, 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 the principle behind it is that there was a choosing. And we are going to have that opportunity in life. Remember, this is not something that we want to be just a program, that we do it for eight weeks. We are getting together for eight weeks, but it's just an excuse to hang out. Because ultimately, it should be a lifestyle. Where we are constantly asking ourselves, God, do you want me to disciple that person? You want me to disciple that person? 
And if the answer is yes, then these are the characteristics we need to be looking for. People who are willing, who are available, most importantly, they are teachable. And uh, Chelsea, you were saying it, and uh, Robert Coleman said it too. So we meet with Kyle and Matt and Brian, and uh, we, we meet with, uh, with Mark, and then on another day we meet with Ross and uh, with uh, Nick and, and Jabril. And let me tell you this, it's just awesome for me. I just love hanging out with these guys because I learn. Every time we get together, it's like, well, I'm doing a discipleship. No, we're building each other up. It's the fellowship of men coming together or with women coming together with, you know, that, well, you know that gets together with the wives. It's just a beautiful process of getting a relationship that lasts for a long time. And so he suggests in his first, in his first chapter some things that we need to consider, which is pray for God to raise them up. In other words, we want you now, this week, start praying, God, who do you want me to disciple from this community? You need to start asking God, who do you want me to mentor? In this community. Away from our family, because remember, I kind of joke with Chelsea about what is Yannabelle telling you about me? And the reason why I kind of joke at least joke about that is because I am personally responsible for this. I think my kids first. So I understand that that's our number one responsibility. But beyond our sphere of influence of our family, the challenge we want to give you is there's other people that you can be influencing as well. And in this case, we need to be praying for them. God, raise them up. Show me clearly who you want me to mentor. Notice receptive hearts, especially those drawn to you. I told you, today I heard that somebody left relevance because they hate the way I teach. So clearly, not everybody's gonna like me or my style or they're gonna feel identified with me. Am I gonna kill myself over it? No, we love them, we we'll miss you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not special friend, huh? no, I'm I, can't, I can't tell it to everybody, but there's certain people that can be there with me. And those are the ones that I want to disciple. Let me just give you an example. So we're doing the discipleship Sunday night. I'm not the geeky kind of person. I'm more the, kind, the, the sporty kind of person. I like to do sports. And when I went out on uh, Sunday night, there were like four guys playing basketball out there in the court. Not encouraging guys, of course. They're playing the music. They're cursing and all that kind of stuff. But immediately, I was drawn to them. And they were drawn to me just because I like sports. And the first comment that one of them made is like, hey, is that a Tesla with ludicrous mode? And I said, yes. And he said, would you take me on a ride? And I said, if you beat me in basketball. And all his friends were like, ooh. <laughs> and so I played with them and I beat him and Ross saw it. And I still gave him the ride. <laughs> and at the end, there was a bridge that was open because we were drawn naturally by something we both like. We like sports, we like cars. So. That is something that we need to be receptive to. There's certain people in our community, or maybe outside our community, that you are drawn to naturally. Those are the people that you need to be aware and conscious about because those are the ones that you will be able to walk through with the process of the salvation. And of course, keep a low profile. We, through the years, our team in, in Latin America that disciples people have been asked the question, what is the best discipleship manual that you know? Let me tell you, there's a bunch of manuals out there. One of them is uh, perspectives, navigators. There's a bunch of one, a, a bunch of them, but they're so loaded and so heavy and so full of homework that I don't think everybody can take them. So I decided to take low profile, and I decided to say this sounds so spiritual, but I said the best manual for the subject is the Bible. And just study the Bible instead of taking a manual that makes it so heavy. Just low profile. No, we're just going to hang out. And we're going to study the Bible together and build a relationship with each other. Does that make sense? Yes. So selection, those are some of the principles that you need to be aware of. Now let me stop. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Do you guys think this is good? I love this. This is amazing. I mean, I get so excited because I see all of you guys from here, and I'm like, oh my goodness, we're going to come to the world for Christ. <laughs> it's so exciting. Because when you think 12, make the impact that they made, and look at all of us here, all with incredible leadership potential, there is no limit to what can happen. So I, uh, I am so excited because this, for me, means that, yes, God has given us, each community, the resources to impact the world for Christ. And so this is very exciting to me. But any other comments, uh, suggestions, questions, smart remarks?
<laughs> Nitpicky. <laughs> Before we go. <laughs> yes. I think it's great to have a time frame, but it depends, Chelsea was saying, it right. depends on the person as well. It's like our kids. You know it 11 times. Each kid is different. Right. And you cannot get them to grow the same uh, time frame. I'm, I wish I, I, I could, I, I only have four, and I can't get them to focus on the same time frame. So yes, it's good, but we have to be flexible to think that maybe it will take eight months instead of six, or maybe they'll get it in four and they'll be discipling somebody else. So I think it's good to have it, but we have to be flexible with it. Yes, please. But in your book, there is a suggestion. Okay. Now this is not a half to hard, fast rule, but starting March the 8th is like Pastor Jeffrey went over selection, okay? So next week, it's association. And so that's what you're going to be doing. First week selection, second association. So you'll have eight weeks if you want to follow this with your disciple. That, that's the plan. Good. Eight weeks, even though, it, personally, eight weeks seems very short time to walk with somebody the steps of life. But these are eight principles that will help you understand better how long you're going to extend that relationship until they're ready to decide with somebody else. Phil has asked that many questions, many times that question, but when when do I stop? I mean, when do I say, okay, guys, it's enough, you know, you know, now start discipling somebody else. And so there's not one specific amount of time. I think, well, Jesus used three years. We could also say that. And some of them still work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other comments? Yes, Scott. I found we had a discipleship group that lasted about 10 years. Sure. And it was um, a very difficult time of day. It was Friday mornings. Oh, yeah. So yeah. people had to be there to come and go to work late or, you know, did not work. But, but um, well, what made it last so long, we, we, we pressed upon them to continue to invite to the group. Okay. And then what we saw was, you know, People it was inconvenient for to come on Friday mornings. Well, they started their own group in Cape Coral, and, yeah. and then another group over in Lehigh. Um, so it was by continually adding, just, you know, hey, look for somebody that you can bring with you, you know? And, uh, and that grew, and it, it was changing, right? Because it was not, it, it was, was constantly changing right. because of that. Because, you know, they all want to come and stay in the group. The trouble is that gets off the comfortable. Yeah. And then you start, I go crazy, you know, you guys start criticizing. Sometimes it's too deep, you know, you've been it, hammered it over too long. And uh, you want to encourage them to start their own. That's exactly. Right. And that happens by just association. They yeah. make, you know, two people who've been capable of, yeah, go ahead and start. Start a over there. And we have to be intentional about and it. And neither one of them visit theirs every once in a while. So you're not doing it Friday night anymore? Friday morning? Friday morning. Oh, Friday morning. Uh, no. uh, not more. We're going to something, but. In May. <laughs> <laughs> no! Good, okay. Okay, any other comments, May guys? Retreat. <laughs> okay, all right. Leadership retreat in May, guys. <laughs> any other questions? Comments? Yes, Joy. I just want to say, from a, um, a staff and probably an elder perspective, this is amazing. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> really, really amazing. This is. Um, I mentioned something to Amy. It's just really encouraging to us, um, and I know to Chelsea, to see that you guys are passionate about this. I mean, we've been praying about this, and Chelsea's put a lot of work into it, and we talk about it in staff meetings and everything. I know that elders have um, really been working on it really hard, and to see all of you guys here, like, really makes me want to cry. I mean, it's just really awesome, because this is, like, this is our church. Like, this is the leadership. This is what's going to move our church forward. This is, um, I just think it's really awesome. 
that we get together and we spend this time together. And I just know from a perspective of us, it's really encouraging to us to see that you guys are excited about doing this. Amen. So, thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. Let's stand. Let's pray. With this.